is to get photographs that meet the very high standards that Mark sets. And I'm not sure I'm going to make it, but at least they can use mine as the basis for having a professional take these photographs. So if I seem a little bit disoriented, it's in part because it's been quite intense. And in fact, um, I've only been in, in this is my second day. Uh, I arrived. Thanks. Well, I, I have and keep one of these pads in close hand at all times. Um, even in the States, I want you all to know. Um, I arrived in India on Thursday, and so here we are only Saturday. So it's been only 48 hours. So please forgive me if um, I don't uh, sound entirely coherent. I start the book by asking a series of questions. And I haven't opened my computer just to remind me of what some of the questions are. But I thought I might throw this out as an issue. And then as I do, um, let me bring in, in a way, the environment. When I think about Nalanda, <clears throat> according to Xuan Song, a traveler who was at Nalanda, as probably many, if not all of you know, during the 7th century, there were 10,000 monks at Nalanda. And that's a huge number by any measure. And as one of the participants in the January seminar effectively told me, explained to me, 10,000 is simply a round number that means a great deal. It's an exaggeration. And according to another traveler, Yi Jing, who was here a little bit later, there were 3,000 monks. But either way, it doesn't make a huge difference. 3,000 or 10,000 makes a huge impact, it seems to me, on the environment, uh, both because they live and work as people in this envi in the environment of a very small, physically small institution. And while I assume that Nalanda was a great deal larger than the present excavated area, there's some evidence, and I saw more of it today, um, that Nalanda extended to the north by at least as far as the current excavated area. So think of it as at least double, if not triple, the size of the present ticketed area. But even that notwithstanding, to hold 3,000, or maybe even 10,000, but in any event, a great, great number of monks would have required a great deal. Imagine, instead of just ruins, the term that I love to see, tongue in cheek when I say love to see, that is, I don't really mean it. Nalanda ruins in the, um, in the signage that leads up to the site. Because it, it's so much more than ruins. Yeah. And I think in our minds, it's very important to project people back onto those buildings or the remains of the buildings. Now imagine how much food it might take to feed 3,000 or 10,000 monks. My standard would be this. The Golden Temple in Amritsar gives approximately a half kilo of uh, food per person per day. You know the Golden Temple feeds huge, huge numbers of uh, people who come there simply to eat. They're um, not just to see the Gansan, uh, the, the holy book, but to um, participate in the life of the temple. So I have a half a kilo per person per day. Now, imagine then, 3,000 uh, monks would have needed um, how am I going to do this? About 1.5 tons of food per day. I think I've got the arithmetic right here. Though, as a humanist, I will confess math is my um, <laughs> so But I started off planning to be an electrical engineer. <laughs> I'm serious. And I started off my first year of university doing electrical engineering until calculus. And that, uh, <laughs> that 
completely true. I think, by the way, today, if I could go back and do it, I could do the calculus. Because I think I understand the logic now, much too late. And I'm glad that I'm doing what I'm doing. And I feel hugely, hugely fortunate that I get paid to do things that are fun and interesting and exciting. But anyway, let's think of at least one and a half tons of food per day. Think of the impact on the environment. Think, too, of the support team that all of those monks who produce neither goods nor services would require. I do not assume that the monks function, for example, as builders of the monasteries or sculptors for the images that are there. I assume that is the work of professionals rather than um, the monks themselves. I think the monks probably did write the manuscripts. We have at least seven manuscripts that I can put my hands on now that have colophon pages saying that they were produced at Milan. So, and there were obviously a great deal many more, and we know who the scribes of those seven manuscripts were, and the people, the ones who illustrated them. It seems to me from their names and the ways in which they describe themselves, they probably were monks. I do not, however, assume the monks functioned as farmers, producing food, or as sculptors, or doing all the myriad other things. So you must imagine, then, that for every monk there was at Nalanda, there had to be at least one or two other uh, people on the periphery of the monastery who were stitching robes for the monks. They did, after all, need more than a single robe that they came to the monastery with. Um, you need to imagine farmers. You need to imagine people transporting grain um, and cooking it and doing all of the other functions. So I think we need to think of a fairly large population that was concentrated at or very, very close to the monastery. But I also, to jump around and not just stay on uh, a single track, it was your association with environmental studies that made me think about saying some of these things. Um, that I think we also need to understand what I would call the mythology of Nalanda, though maybe better said, the multiple stories that go with Nalanda. We, after all, have a great, great many perspectives. We have the Chinese pilgrims, <coughs> whom many take, and especially the 19th century explorers took as a kind of accurate travel log, describing Nalanda in precise detail. But these pilgrims, Xuanzang perhaps first among them, were not writing while they were at Nalanda. They wrote after they returned to China. And they wrote usually for a very specific purpose. To take Xuanzang as just one example, he wrote to, uh, in, in part, establish his own bona fides, his own authority, by being, having been at the places where the Buddha walked, and taught, and had lived his life. Now, Nalanda was not part of that. But it was at Nalanda that there were distinguished teachers who expounded, perhaps even every single day, on specific texts. And so by describing his presence at Malanda, he was there. He was in a position to hear the great uh, learned teachers, if I may call them that, those who provided a kind of daily uh, sermon, a daily uh, description of or analysis of the various texts, one text in particular with which Nalanda was so intimately associated 
known as the Pardnial Armament uh, Sutta. So, um, and, and he was also writing his um, travel, so to speak, his, his memories of Milanda and the other places he visited, specifically for the Tang Dynasty Emperor. And so, if he says that kings in India were very generous to the Buddhists, and he says that repeatedly, citing Harsha Vardhana, among others, who was his contemporary, and harking back to the Guptas, and of course, even invoking Ashoka, 